Good evening. Hello, my name is Josh Brumberg, and I'm the Dean for the Sciences here at the Graduate Center. I'm delighted to welcome you to our final City of Science event of the seminar of the semester focused on climate change and health. As a public university, the Graduate Center and its associated Advanced Science Research Center are committed to the idea that our scientific research has a role in advancing the public good. To help us understand climate change and its impact on human health, I'm very happy to introduce tonight's panel, and I'll introduce from left to right. Uh, to my uh, immediate left is Dr. Hamid Naruzi, who is a professor in the Department of Construction Management and Civil Engineering at the New York City College of Technology, and a member of the PhD program in Earth and Environmental Sciences at the Graduate Center. His research utilizes remote sensing to study climate change and its impact on water resources in both urban and rural environments. Sitting just to his left is Dr. Patrizia Casaccia, who is both a scientist and a clinician, and is a professor in our biology and biochemistry PhD programs, and the founding director of the Advanced Science Research Center's Neuroscience Initiative. Her research has focused on neurological disorders with a special emphasis on multiple sclerosis. Recently, she has been investigating, investigating how environmental factors can impact organisms on the genomic level and in turn impact their behavior and health. Uh, immediately to her left is Dr. Yoko Nomura, who is a professor of psychology at Queens College and a member of our PhD program in psychology here at the Graduate Center. Her research focuses on how stress and pregnancy can impact the subsequent trajectory of the developing fetus and resultant neonate onto adolescence and beyond. And our final panelist is Dr. Reggie Blake, the Associate Provost and Dean of Curriculum and Research and a Professor of Physics at the New York City College of Technology and a member of our Earth and Environmental Sciences doctoral program here at the Graduate Center. His research uses remote sensing to model climate and its impact on urban environments. Finally, a few words on how tonight's event will unfold. I will lead our panelists in discussion, and towards the end of our time together, I will invite you to ask uh, topical questions for our panel to respond to. And when we uh, call on you, we'll bring a microphone over to you, because we're also welcoming in our audience in the live stream, and we have, they would also like to hear your questions. So starting off today, I think it's very important to define our terms. So when we talk about climate change, what is, the inv what is climate change, and what is the evidence that climate is changing? And to remind you guys to pick up your microphones. Um, well, um, when, when they say actually the first defining actually the, the, the word climate, uh, just the analogy that they make, you know, what is the difference between climate and weather? So they say that weather is your mood at the moment, but your climate is your, the climate is your personality. So that's the, uh, that's the issue that um, our Earth, our, um, the only home that we have, is being through centuries and thousands of years have gone through actually changes. So that's a, that's a known fact that we had ice age and all those cycles in, in our um, in our Earth, but what we call and what we know as um, climate change uh, nowadays is we are talking about the industrial and human-induced actually changes that we see that are rapidly are changing the way that uh, uh, the, that personality has been actually pretty constant for many, many uh, centuries or thousands of years. So um, uh, the, uh, these are known facts that our um, Earth is uh, one degree warmer than a uh, decade ago. It is a uh, known fact that the last decade was the warmest time that this um, planet has uh, basically seen before. And there are many a uh, number of frequency of the extreme events that we, they were happening very rarely. They are getting actually more frequent. So, the one degree, you may think that it's not a big deal, so one degree is okay, I can tolerate one degree increase in the temperature, but the problem is that the impact that it has it in the severity and frequency of the extreme events that we have. So that's the issue that uh, uh, we, um, 
we are facing, and that's what we are actually see the evidence of. The climate change has been started, you know, has been rapidly going um, um, in, a, in the wrong direction, in the, at least in the uh, last 40, 50 years. So I don't know how much time you, I can just go no, with that. No, no, that's, that's great. I, I guess w one question is, how are we monitoring it? So you say it's, it's one degrees warmer, it's the, it's the hottest decade that we've, we've existed in. How, how do we know that? Reggie, do you want to? Well, I wanted to just uh, add something to what uh, Hamid said prior. Um, there's what we call natural variability versus climate change, and natural variability are the natural cycles that the Earth goes through that has nothing to do with mankind. So um, we've been through changes through ice ages, as Hamid said, and uh, we're now in this warm period, and these are things uh, that can occur naturally. Climate change, and more precisely anthropogenic climate change, has to do with the things that we as human beings are doing to accelerate the warming. And so typically when we study climate change, we're looking more at human-induced climate change and how we have um, changed the climate by uh, increasing the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So we, we know that um, the, the climate has been changing for uh, places like New York City and other global cities and globally uh, for sure, um, based on shifts that we have seen. We call them climatic shifts. And these shifts occur uh, in both the means and the extremes. So we can see that the mean temperature or the mean rainfall amounts have been changing globally. We can also see that the extremes have also changed. So when we talk about climate change, we're talking about changes in both or shifts in both the means and in the extremes. Uh, here at New, in New York City, for example, uh, we've done a lot of work with uh, New York City Panel of Climate Change. And we can see that uh, over the last, um, uh, since we start recording temperature, for example, uh, about 1880 or so, that globally we have seen the mean temperature go up. Uh, we have uh, copious evidence that even our temperature at Central Park has been going up by about 0.2 degrees Fahrenheit per decade. Same is true for LaGuardia Airport or Kennedy Airport. So we do have evidence that the local temperature uh, has been shifting and changing, same for the rainfall. And so um, the way we know this is by monitoring, and by monitoring we have all kinds of um, rudimentary and sophisticated means of measuring uh, these climatic variables of temperature, rainfall. Um, we, we have seen a sea level rise. We have seen all of these main variables shift and change in the direction that we really don't want them to move in over the last uh, 100 years or so. So the evidence is there. We use the general rudimentary methods of uh, instrumentation, uh, meteorological networks that we have at different points in the city to take measurements all over the city. Uh, we have tidal gauges to measure sea level rise. Uh, Hamid and I are now involved in using satellite remote sensing to study land surface temperature. So there, 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 there's a plethora, there are a plethora of um, uh, tools and instrumentations and methodologies that we utilize to measure and to monitor uh, climate change impacts and changes to our climate. So those are some of the state-of-the-art ways in which it's been done. People are shifting more now to met nets and to uh, satellite remote sensing to fully understand what's happening to our climate. So those are some of the ways, Josh, in which we can monitor what's going on with, with the climate. Okay, and so, Oyoko, you wanted to add? Hello. Hi. Uh, we all know somebody said climate change is a hoax, but we all know also it's not true. Uh, now we, we got the really scientific and the technology, techno, technical explanation, really good explanation uh, of why we know uh, climate change is occurring. But we personally, we know, we all of us know. Uh, for example, last winter, how many times we have sn uh, snow days? 
uh, w last winter, when I see the snow coming down, I got excited. I thought, oh my God, it's snow. I was really, I, I don't see the mountains of, mountains of snows in New York City anymore. And I went in summer, I went to uh, eat oysters. There is no oysters available because sea surface, level of the sea is going up, so is temperature. So the temperature, raising the temperature in the sea is cooking oysters. Therefore, we have an oyster shortage and we, oysters cannot reproduce, cannot have babies. And therefore, we, are, we ended up not having oysters. So that is just one example. We feel it. We know climate change is happening. So just, just to quickly add there, Josh, if yeah. I may quickly, uh, we've, um, we've also seen an increase in forest fires. You've seen the news and forest fires increase. We've seen uh, more intense hurricanes occurring and more major hurricanes. These are hurricanes above Category 3. More of those are occurring uh, each hurricane season. Uh, we've seen rises in sea levels globally. Uh, all of these coastal flooding, all of these things are occurring now, and uh, as I said, there's copious evidence of all of these things, and flooding all over the world, uh, the monsoons uh, in Pakistan and Bangladesh, they have been intensified, and so the evidence of climate change is, is really everywhere. Uh, anyone, uh, non-scientist, can tell that something is happening to, to our climate. And so um, when Yoko says this is not a hoax, well, even grandma can tell you that. She doesn't have to be a scientist, but just observing that the, 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 the cold temperatures in the wintertime have been much warmer. Or during the wintertime, we don't have the temperatures being so extremely cold anymore. So there, there are many indicators that we can use to, to tell that something is shifting in the climate regime. So I want to pull on two threads there. You know, first Yoko said we're, we're cooking the oysters, and maybe Patrizia can show us the link between, you know, changing a few temperature, uh, degrees temperature and how that's impacting the health uh, of humans or impacting other living organisms. So I think that uh, in terms of human health, right, we can start uh, distinguishing different factors. There is the air, there is the water, there is the soil. And then there are urban area with a certain composition of the air, and there are rural area with different composition of the air. So you can imagine or envision the effect of the climate change on health as dependent on multiple factors, right? So let's say in the city, since we are in the city, there is pollution in the streets, right? There is clear pollution the heat is going to affect the composition and the level of aggregation of the particles. Similarly, in the water, um, uh, Yoko referred to the oysters, but similarly, if you think, rising temperature increase the growth of certain bacteria in the water, of certain algae in the water that can have toxic effects. So which organs are then affected? Well, in this case, and, and maybe we'll discuss even later, there is more of a physical aspect of the effect of climate, health, climate change on health, which is related to what we can call the contact organs. If you think of the air and the air particles, your contact organ is going to be the lung. So this is where, with increased heat, we are going to have more pollens, more ragwood, and this is increasing the level of respiratory allergies. There are more problems with uh, cardiovascular and respiratory disorders related to heat. On the other hand, if you think of the effect of water, which would be warming of the water, but you can also think every time there is a hurricane, there is heavy contamination of water with sewage spillage. This creates issues, right, in terms of the digestive tracts because that's where the water and the food is going to enter. And you can also think water and kidney diseases. So there are a lot of organs whose susceptibility is related to the type of the effect that the climate has on the specific composition of air, soil, and water. 
And then, and I'm sure we'll discuss later, there are indirect effects which are related to the consequences of climate change. Let's say you have a wildfire, you have a hurricane, you have to leave your home. You have to leave, so communities are disrupted. There is a personal uh, loss, right, of uh, critical things, I mean, of your fortune, right? But there is also a huge disruption of communities. And this induces what are called indirect effect of climate change that are mostly related to psychological distress and uh, several, uh, um, several other possibilities in this case. One last thing I wanted to mention is, uh, until now, this was the classification, right? So you can imagine larger particles, contact, right? So it can be, as we said, the gastrointestinal tract, the respiratory tract, or the kidney, the cardiovascular. And the brain was always considered a privileged organ because it was not in contact. There are a lot of filters between the blood and the brain. But with technology, we are using more and more, you know, microplastics, nanoparticles that are from the socks, to the chocolate, to the, to the cosmetics that we use. Those small, small, tiny particles that are also contaminating our environment can filter through those, uh, uh, they can pass through those filters. And therefore, on top of the climate change, we have to look at the effect that uh, all this industrialization is creating where we then arrive to a level of increasing neuroinflammation so that it's not just a psychological distress, but also a neurological effect on the brain itself. Yeah, I want to follow up one of the things uh, Patricia said, and this also something that Reggie said is, you know, it, it's Manhattan, location, location, location. So how is, is the impact of climate change uniform depending upon you where, where you live, or does it vary by urban to suburban to rural, or is it even at a more micro level than that? Anyone? Yeah. Um, so uh, as far as human um, concerned, obviously where, where most people live and population exists, that's the part that they will be more affected. But uh, especially coastal areas are the ones that are uh, more affected because they are um, exposed to variety of um, type of um, um, extreme events. There could be actually a hurricane, flooding, as well as you know heat waves. So these are actually the uh, the type of uh, various types of because of the geographic location of the land and the ocean and you know. The, the, the vegetation, the lower actually elevation level that they have, they are more exposed to uh, sea level rise, more flooding, and uh, so that's in terms of a geographical location. Uh, the, it, it affects everyone, the whole planet. If you are in the Amazon, you know, that uh, the, the, we, we see that climate change impacts them, you know, the, the biodiversity of the habitat that uh, they are there. Uh, but as far as, again, you know, uh, the, the location is everywhere, but as far as people in uh, highly populated areas, cities, coastal areas are the ones that are most uh, vulnerable. And um, if they are certain demographic also, basically, in terms of um, um, economic level or the access to resources, they might be even have uh, uh, to face more consequences when, when it comes to climate change. And what would be those co consequences? I think, Reggie, you've done some work about how different communities are impacted by climate change. Sure, and if I just uh, follow up on something Hamid said, uh, if one takes a temperature transect, if you will, from uh, a rural area through an urban area and get back to a rural area, then you'll see that there's a spike in temperature as you go over the uh, urban area. And, and that's what we call the urban heat island effect. So if you're living in an urban area, uh, the materials that make up the urban area have a strong uh, heat storage capacity. So they hold on to the heat, the concrete and uh, the asphalt. They will hold on to the heat a much longer 
than if you're in a rural area where you don't have those types of materials. So uh, places in uh, the city are, are much warmer than places that are in rural areas. So if you take a transect from, I don't know, Long Island all the way up through Westchester, passing through Manhattan, you'll find a spike in temperature over Manhattan simply because of the, uh, the, the storage heat capacity of the materials that are in, in cities. And so folks who live in the city will therefore uh, go through this, this warmer uh, microclimate than folks who are outside of the, the city. And your question, Josh, was about? Are there, like with, within the city, is it uniform or are certain, you know, Hamid just made the point that access to resources also will affect the impact on different communities? Absolutely true. Uh, Hamid and I, we do some work in uh, an underserved neighborhood in Brooklyn called Bedford-Stuyvesant. And uh, it is very clear from the work we've done for the last almost a decade now that people in underserved neighborhoods uh, suffer more of the consequences of, adverse consequences of climate change. Uh, because they have, uh, well, bed is changing now, uh, but prior to the gentrification that's going on now, uh, the lack of green space, for example. And so with lack of green space, then you'll find heat, uh, more of the uh, sensible heat is being trapped, and so those places were much warmer. We, we do work with satellite and ground-based remote sensing looking at land surface temperature, and uh, you can see spikes, hot spots, in the poor neighborhoods because of a lack of green spaces. Uh, there's a lack of uh, um, cooling centers in these poorer neighborhoods. And so people who live in these areas are certainly more prone to heat stress. Uh, whenever heat waves occur, they're more uh, susceptible to, to illness and, and death. And so there is really a social environmental justice component to climate change that needs to be investigated. And the p people who are most vulnerable are the ones who are black and brown. And those are the facts, and we can, we can show that. It's easy to see that in the poorer neighborhoods, that that's where the impacts are mostly being, being felt. So a lack of green spaces, lack of cooling centers, um, a lack of awareness even. And so there's an educational component that's needed in these, these areas. And I think if the city is really serious about um, ameliorating climate change or the impacts thereof, then they need to spend some time looking at what's going on in underserved neighborhoods. And uh, if you ask me, they have not done a good job thus far. Yeah. Uh, in addition to that, uh, in addition to lack of green space, if you can imagine there is a good park with a bunch of trees, everybody, children, old people, uh, all of us are likely to go to the park in the evening and hang out and enjoy our, you know, each other's company. Alternatively, uh, the, clim the raising the climate, the temperature is caused by the use of air conditioner. We have to have an air conditioner for, especially for p people who are vulnerable at a population such as elderly and uh, uh, people with disability or some medical condition. But air conditioner is really kind of, it's making things worse. But it's necessary. But imagine if you have a place in, in a neighborhood with a bunch of trees and having uh, water fountains. And you know, we used to go uh, take our children to Hippo Park. Hippo Park is famous in the west side, which has a bunch of hippopotamus. And uh, hippopotamus shoot their uh, you know, waters. And it's really fun to walk, uh, run around and everybody come together. And that kind of thing is lacking in a poor neighborhood. And we really have to come together to just really try to find a way to just act collectively because we can, it's not time for us to just focus on our individual need. We have to protect our earth and we have to protect us together. So the other thing, uh, Yoko, before you put your mic down, 
uh, Hamid said the other uh, communities that were as vulnerable were the coastal communities. And you've done some work, and he, the other thing that he mentioned is that we're seeing more severe weather, typhoons, hurricanes, storms that are impacting the coastal communities. Patrizia made the point that, you know, there's a disruption and they have to move, but maybe you could share with us a little bit about your findings that the, the pregnant mothers who moved, there was uh, additional impacts. I have a study, longitudinal study, uh, comparing children who are conceived during Superstorm Sandy versus uh, children who are born already or are, uh, conceived after the Superstorm Sandy. When I started the, uh, the experiment, uh, this is a human experiment and uh, using taking advantage of the unfortunate event, natural disaster, Superstorm Sandy. I didn't really expect to see drastic differences between the two groups. It's not only mothers. Mothers, you know, of course, I, we care for maternal health. M mother's Day is coming up this weekend. Uh, congratulations to mothers. <laughs> but also children who are born, uh, who are pregnant, who are in tummy, mother's tummy during Superstorm Sandy, are likely to be more reactive, meaning they are less able to control their emotions. And as some of you probably know, that emotion regulation, that part of the brain which control the emotion regulation also control our cardiovascular function, our body regulation. So Patricia, Patricia mentioned uh, uh, respiratory illness, or uh, I, I don't know if you said uh, diabetes and all that, but all those illness uh, is a f at the Superstorm Sandy, we don't really know what part of Superstorm Sandy which are causing the difference, but differences, but it is clear the exposure to that during conception, in conception, during you are in tummy, cause so many different problems. And in addition to that, I recently, uh, you know, inspired by our colleagues sitting here, I started looking at the temperature uh, when you are in tummy, just like my oyster example. When you are cooked in tummy uh, during high temperature, what's gonna happen? I have been looking at just only maternal consequences, but uh, what I see is uh, mothers who, have, who are pregnant during hot period, hot months, uh, Ju Ju June, July, August, are more likely to have a gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, they are more likely to have an infection. Uh, they have all those, uh, you know, those prevalent medical conditions. And why it's bad for the mothers, but what really is important is those medical condition during pregnancy is gonna be passed on to the offspring. Not in a medical condition by itself, but in a way, uh, in their ability to control their emotion, regulate their emotion, which means more psychiatric problems and neurobiological problem and all that. And I, if, uh, if I'm gonna, if anybody, nobody stop me, I'm gonna keep going, so I'm gonna stop myself. <laughs> All right, thank you, Yoko. But uh, picking up on that transgenerational effect, so the, the developing fetus is experiencing some impacts. And Patrizia, could you kind of postulate a little bit about how that is impacting the developing fetus as, it, as it's growing inside the mother's tummy? So one part of, uh, of my lab works on uh, the molecular effect of uh, environmental signals on the DNA. So we all have DNA, but we're all humans, we share the same DNA, but we look different, we are different, we behave differently, right? And all the cells of our body have the same DNA, but some cells are blood cells, some cells are hair, some cells are skin, right? How does that happen? It happens because there is a process that's called epigenetic regulation 
that allows certain genes to be expressed, other genes not to be expressed. And what has become clear is that uh, these processes are regulated both by chemical stimuli and by physical stimuli, so that you can have certain stimuli that are allowing certain genes to go up and certain genes to go down. And in, a, in the study, for instance, that we did with, uh, with Yoko, we could see Yoko was uh, uh, able to retrieve the placenta from mothers who gave birth during Superstorm Sandy versus mother that gave birth at another time. And what we could see is that if we look at some epigenetic changes in this placental sample, they're present. Now, as Yoko said, we don't know what caused those changes, but there are changes. So clearly, the placenta of a mother who experienced Superstorm Sandy was different than the placenta of a mother that did not experience it. What are the consequences on the children? We cannot predict from a transgenerational perspective on the DNA, but for instance, Yoko could show that uh, the children whose placenta had changes, they had certain behavioral differences. Perhaps they were more agitated, they were less cuddly right, than, 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 uh, than others. And so this is just uh, as, a, as an example. And then again, if I, I can continue more later if you... If no, I, please go ahead. No, no so, so if you think of the concept of epigenetic, started with the idea of um, famine. So there was this period during the Second World War in, uh, in Europe where you know, the Nazis were stopping the trains to go and uh, provide food. And there were a lot of mothers who were pregnant who could not get food. So the babies in the uterus of these mothers experienced famine. I mean, these were women who could not eat for days and days, right? As a result, the baby, DNA, smartly said, I have to make sure that I get as much nutrient from the whatever little food I can get. And so the DNA got epigenetically modified so that those children could extract as much nutrient from the little food that they had as possible. The war ended, the babies were born, now are you know, a little bit older perhaps uh, than, the, than me, but uh, overall, you know, it's uh, our generation where now food is no longer scarce. The result has been that there is an increase in obesity and diabetes because the DNA still has the memory of what happened decades ago. And this is just one example of how transgenerational an experience that you could have in one moment can be transmitted and then have long-term consequences. Oh, Reggie, please. I just wanted to ask uh, my fellow, my fellow uh, panelists here a question, if I could. Is that allowed, Josh, or not? Go, go right ahead. Because I, I was just wondering, I mean, Superstorm Sandy occurred in 2012, about 11 years ago. And we're talking about atmospheric conditions that caused the hurricane to develop to be this hybrid storm that caused so much damage. The changes in the onborn, were they due to the atmospheric changes or due to the external stress or what really triggered it? Yeah. Short answer is we really don't know. That's what we are really trying to tease out. What we know, as Patricia said, is that there is a clear evidence uh, that behavior and medical problems, and the psychiatric problems are different among those two groups. Not only that, we are collaborating with uh, some of uh, her colleagues at uh, Advanced Science Research Center, we have an imaging study. We have looked at the brain the brain, which really indicate uh, emotion regulation, such as amygdala and frontal, frontal part of the brain, is, you know, has changed. It's either becoming bigger or smaller. We haven't looked at the functional data yet, but it, the changes in the brain and the behaviors are clear. I don't know what happened first, but it's not really 
only a fake change. It's there. What we don't know is what caused it. And because it's really difficult to study human. Uh, as you know, in human, we cannot force a mother to be in a cartwheel and make them run, run, run until they get really exhausted and give up. Or they can put them in a swimming pool and make them swim until they give up and die. We cannot do that. So we really don't know what is happening because we cannot really experiment on t uh, human, and humans are messy. We do certain things, we don't really constrain our behavior, we do whatever we want, basically. So controlling for those differences from one person to the other is uh, really, you know, out of what, uh, what do you call it? Science, science, the main work for us. So we have to do one little piece at a time, try to build a block, and going back and forth between animals and human, animal and human, so that we'll be able to pinpoint what exactly happening. And my guess is, it's not only one thing. A lot of things are happening, and we are, why do we care? It's because if we know what is changing, we'll be able to uh, tailor some you know, effective interventions, because we know climate change is happening. We know hurricanes are happening more frequently with greater magnitude as we live. So that's what we are doing, and I'm sorry to disappoint you, but <laughs> going back again, I don't know. So I may offer a slightly different perspective, and uh, although we, do, we cannot determine if there are, let's say, physical factors or specific chemical factors that we can pinpoint, I think something that we could correlate is maternal stress. Maternal stress we can measure through hormones, right, that we can measure in the blood, in the saliva, and chronic stress you can measure in the hair. The closer is that, you know, we tend to accumulate cortisol so that the kind of history of our stress level can be from our hair. So from this we can think that, you know, one potential way to start distinguishing what I was mentioning before, direct versus indirect effect, could be to level the measure of stress. And if you can correlate with stress, so perhaps then it's more a stress-related pathway being activated and then eventually using animal studies, the only way we could do some... So, so say there would then be an external force of stress. Precisely. And you could have other means of stress that could... Mm -hmm. Precisely, precisely. So... Go, yeah, go ahead, Patricia. Okay, so the other thought that I had is that every time you have a disaster in one part of the world or in one part of the country, the consequences are felt also somewhere else. Just think of the food chain and the food distribution. Just think of the composition of the soil. Like you buy, I don't know, your broccoli, thinking that there is a certain concentration of vitamin and minerals, but if the soil is changed, you don't have what's written in the label because the soil has been impoverished. So, and many of those uh, climate-related changes from fire to contamination of the water to hurricanes do affect the microbiota in the soil, do affect the property of the soil, and the consequences of this are much more widespread than just the local community as well. So, to turn, you know, that we're talking about the impact of climate change, but uh, Yoko used an important way. If we, we knew a little bit more, we could do interventions to maybe ameliorate some of the impact. Reggie made the point we need to do a better job in the city about providing resources or uh, engineering communities to make them more resilient for climate change. So now if you were a king or queen for the day, if you were coronated instead of Charles last Saturday, what would you do initially to try to help things? Go right ahead. Okay. Uh, somebody told me a long time ago, Yoko, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. And that's exactly what I would do. I, we cannot choose one. We have to start doing everything. And even if everything is small in a scale, we have to get started, and we shouldn't fight over who go first, who 
go second. We just, I mean, this is, I mean, climate change is real, and we probably can't stop it. It's going to keep going, and we have to learn to ad adapt to it. But we really have to really find a way to just get started and make that, you know, plant seed everywhere, and, uh, you know, keep on going and passing on the idea to everybody. Kamit? Yeah, sure. A um, few weeks ago, um, UN had the UN water event um, um, after after many years, and uh, one of the things that they were going through was reviewing actually pa Paris climate agreement to see that how much, if they are on track, which unfortunately came out that uh, they are not following the plan that they were supposed to. So that's one basically kind of a bad news. But on the other hand, we are living in a very good time in terms of combating climate change because of the resources that we have now compared to 40, 50 years ago. So, for instance, um, Reggie mentioned about the satellite observations, you know, that are going on, used to cost $1 billion to launch a satellite, NASA to launch a satellite, and it was extremely expensive, very hard to have those observations, but the number of satellites that we have had in the past three years have been tripled. So that means that how much basically resources that we have in the observational side. So that will help us to better monitor what scenarios we will be facing uh, in the future. So that would be helpful to start planning uh, for the resources. Um, as far as um, um, citing um, um, uh, United Nations, uh, the, the Secretary Gen General uh, made a point, um, he, he received, I think, an award for it too. Uh, that uh, for his uh, climate, you know, related activities, that um, the resources and the job opportunities that will be through green energy and climate, combating climate change, uh, will create actually three times more opportunities than the existing resources that we have. So it's not only that we're combating that one, because people have to live. It's really easy to say that fix the problem without knowing the consequences. There are cost and benefit, and we are talking about a very complex system, as uh, Yoko mentioned, because um, the, uh, the issue that um, we have here is um, social, economical, physical, and basically health-related issues that we are dealing with. So, it, uh, so a complex system, so it's really hard to give an answer without basically carrying some consequences. So the idea, uh, an example could be the issue with COVID that we had. So uh, we had a, a very severe pandemic, you know, global pandemic that we had, but there was no single solution for it. Um, every government tried their best, they, what they thought that is the best way to combat, you know, COVID. Some people thought that they have to shut down everything that was really helpful because, you know, people were uh, less in touch with each other, in contact with each other, so that uh, uh, would prevent spreading the, the disease. On the other hand, the economical consequences of that, you know, that uh, w uh, were severe. So no one actually could say that it was a perfect solution. There is always every solution that we are dealing with uh, will have uh, consequences. But again, we are in the era that um, a lot of resources in terms of green energy, um, solar, offshore wind, all these resources that we never had. And um, New York State in, in particular is like very progressive uh, in terms of um, uh, in, in the US that, um, to, to take actions. But it is a teamwork. Um, what happens in North Africa will basically affect us here. So um, we should do our part, but it needs a, a really uh, a, a, a teamwork at the, at the global level to, to really come together and think about that it is a problem. It is a problem that we have to adapt. We have to mitigate it, and we have to be resilient. So these are things that uh, we can uh, reverse what has happened already, but we can reduce the consequences that we have hopefully uh, 
uh, in the near future. Uh, Patric uh, Reggie and then Patricia. Yeah, I just wanted to, to follow up on something Hamid said. One of the take home messages that we have given in our NPCC study, uh, we've done three and a fourth one is on the way, but the take home message has been uh, adaptation and mitigation must be done and be done simultaneously. So we have to adapt and mitigate at the same time. Curbing the loading of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is paramount. And while we do that, as far as a mitigation method is concerned, our strategy, we have to adapt. And so there are many um, ideas out there. Some have been implemented of, about how we could adapt. And we have to make sure that these adaptation strategies are equitably distributed across the board, especially in vulnerable neighborhoods. So whether you're going to plant some trees or increase green space somehow, whether you're going to have cool roofs, you have to make sure that uh, this is distributed in a way that everyone benefits. If you're going to build structures, the built environment must be so that uh, you can increase albedo, for example, and keep the buildings cooler. Then if you're going to do that, then you've got to do it across the board so that vulnerable populations can also benefit. So many of these communities have been left out in the past, and if we're really serious about equity and diversity and inclusion and all those nice terms that we like to throw around, then we've got to be serious about getting this done. Cool streets, for example. Uh, where, where are you going to put those streets so that the, uh, the, 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 the area is much cooler? So all of these ideas that we know work must be done while we are curbing greenhouse gas emissions, but we've got to do them equitably so everyone benefits. So 100%, I echo what, uh, what Reggie was saying, considering exactly, for instance, the vulnerable population, thinking about uh, elderly people with cognitive impairment, people with uh, motor disabilities, right? You can uh, have as an adaptation and evacuation route, but is it easy for everybody to be able to access it? And I just would like also to mention uh, the difference between adaptation and resilience, right? So we can adapt, we can adjust, we can create technological technology or structure that are going to allow us to withstand the, the, the problems. But the, the real issue is how can we become resilient? Because to stop the climate from changing is going to be a hard task. And so what we can do is maybe to also try to increase the resilience. And in this case, for instance, the CDC uh, has this initiative called BRACE, which is exactly building resilience against climate uh, change. And, uh, and this is something that where we can think in terms of uh, what is resilience. And if we go back to the, the initial step, physical factors related with climate change, as well as, if you want, psychological distress related to climate stress, one can consider these two forms of resilience, an environmental resilience, cooling station and all the above, but also an individual resilience where we are so prone to frustration when, you know, and, and anger, we become much more irritable when something doesn't work or we become super anxious. And all of this, rather than making us more resilient, generates much more stress than worsens the effect of the climate change itself. So in this sense, one, one last thing that I would like to say is Maybe it's worthwhile considering us not as us and nature, but us as part of nature, and also maybe learn from how animals adjust to circumstances, right? There are the, uh, the animals in, um, in, in the wild that when they are super stressed, they found strategies. They shake, shake, shake to get the stress away. Perhaps we can find additional strategy, maybe through mindfulness and other ways, where even in situations of extreme stress, we can hold it together. And this could help us collectively bring an awareness that could allow us to become more resilient as a population. Thank you. And now, in the, in the waning moments, we want to give an opportunity to you, the audience, to ask us questions. The only thing we would say raise your hand and wait until Jimmy puts the microphone uh, up front into your hand so everyone can clearly hear your question. This is to anyone who can answer it. Um, I know there are some people working on alternatives to lithium batteries because lithium, source of lithium has some 
problematic origins in parts of the world. So uh, what do you think are the most promising lithium alternatives out there that are happening right now? And what are the most promising new nuclear innovations? Because I know some have got some startups that are working on you know, small, different kinds of small bore nuclear reactors take less time to build, et cetera. Uh, which, which ones uh, do you think are more promising that might help us in that regard? I think you've uh, asked a question in which our, our panel is not, I mean, Hamid or Reggie, this is not really our area. We do have actually some very good people at CUNY that do this type of research. Unfortunately, I didn't think to ask them, but Hamid or Reggie, you have some? Probably don't have exact answer for you, but uh, what I can tell is that uh, one pres prescription cannot be actually given to every community. Uh, it, it very depends. We're talking about a multifaceted issue here that uh, perhaps uh, combating a lot of other things would help climate change. And, um, and as you mentioned, there was an example that they thought that, okay, if we give pumps and uh, solar panels uh, to a North African country, they would be able actually to extract water from underground and that would help them. It's a very green energy and that's, uh, uh, that would be really helpful. But what happened basically that was that it reduces the recharge, that is the amount of water that was underground that impacted actually downstream. So these are a lot of a very, very complex system that uh, uh, we are dealing with. And um, going back to what, again, if I could add, uh, the equitable and uh, distribution of resources, for instance, was mentioned. So if you look at the map of um, life expectancy in uh, New York City, there are parts that they are different by 10 years. So if you live in one neighborhood, you can live 10 years longer or shorter. And that's a very significant number. Usually numbers change by like months between the regions. And we are talking about a, a city in a, in a, in a very um, kind of advanced country, uh, biggest city in the U.S., and we have that much deviation in, in terms of resources. And when you look at the maps at the zip code level, there are parts that are much shorter life expectancy. And then if you look at the same map as, for instance, um, AC distribution, or how many households they have ACs at home. And you could see that there are parts that are almost 99% of the houses they, or the apartments have them, but there are regions that are that number is up to 70. And again, if you look at the maps of that location that are more exposed to heat, unfortunately those are the regions that are uh, facing more heat, less resources and basically the consequences which could be actually about the life expectancy. So maybe uh, one of the solutions, it may not be a direct solution for uh, mitigation of the effect, it could be actually dealing with other social, economical, and other basically issues. So it's a very, again, you know, complex system that we are thinking uh, we are actually dealing with and that, uh, and that requires um, everyone on the table. It's not, uh, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a, a scientist or a policy maker, you know, um, necessarily. If you, you, if you enhance the education, that might be, you know, something that would be helpful to, to, to combat climate change, so. Thank you. Uh, over here. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering about something that's been coming up repeatedly. You talk about the stresses of under um, so the socioeconomically lowest parts of the city or wherever, but that has through the centuries always resulted in lower, uh, it's smaller, shorter lifespans, more stress, more health. I'm not seeing how it's really linked up to the climate change, which is, you know, created by humans. Uh, I'm wondering if you're seeing a clear distinction or is it just the socioeconomic factors being made worse by climate change? Well, I, yeah, I, 
thank you for the question and comment, actually. So yes, it's, uh, I'm not trying to imply that, you know, that uh, climate change has caused, you know, 10 years of life expectancy. I, I have to basically clarify here. What I'm trying to say is that there is a correlation or there is an impact here. So there was, um, uh, if there is flooding, it doesn't affect the whole city the same. There are part of a city that are more affected by flooding. There was a big heat wave, uh, 2003 in uh, Paris. There was a big uh, heat wave in 1995 in Chicago. The southern part, the northern part, totally different the number of deaths that they, they experienced. So this, is, uh, this reflects that, that if you want to reduce the consequence of a climate change and reduce the death or any health issues, you, you need to basically uh, provide the resources that they would need to, uh, to, to, to face that, uh, basically, a extreme type of weather. I don't know if that... Uh... And Yoko, I think you also wanted to comment. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, what I am finding in my study is uh, prenatal stress is associated with so many different things. Uh, medical illness, mental health, including all sorts of disorders, from anxiety disorder, major depression, dis depressive disorders, attention deficit disorders, phobia, and oppositional defiant disorders. And I have to step back and ask, where is the specificity? Specificity means it should really be affecting one type of disorders, not all of them, which really made me, I mean, we, we haven't done an extensive study yet, but that really made me wonder, we, all, we know emotion regulation is disturbed, which comes in the middle and early childhood, but I am wondering if stress really is like a, you know, darkness in a window, you have dust in a window, you won't be able to see as much as you could if window is uh, clear. So stress really make it uh, more difficult, uh, kind of bring out your weakness to the surface. And if you are under stress, combined with, you know, uh, the difficulty and challenges related to uh, climate change, that effect is going to be amplified. So if you, you know, in a normal circumstance under, uh, as Patricia as said, resilient pe in people might find, but, you know, push off, uh, the fight back the stress and be able to adapt uh, pro uh, uh, optimally. But if you don't have resources or you don't have ability to bounce off on your own, of course, you are going to be crushed. And that's what I think is happening. Stress is not really is a co the direct cause of the equation. Stress, whatever it is, makes a changes in your internal system. But stress make, as I said, stress bring out your weakness, psychological, biological, physiological, all sorts of weakness to the surface. Because you have less resources to deal with, and you, break, you give up at some point. Your body give up, your mind give up, uh, without you telling your body to give up, or your mind to give up, that happens. That's my guess. Thank you. And I wanted to take this moment to thank our panel, Reggie, Yoko, Patrizia, and Hamid. Hopefully, I learned a lot today. Hopefully, you did. Uh, I want to uh, invite everyone uh, to come a, a, neck a week from tomorrow is the Graduate Center's annual dissertation showcase, where you'll get a taste of some of the exciting research that is going on here at the Graduate Center of our, by our students. Each student will be giving, a, condensing five years of research into three minutes. <laughs> so uh, it's really one of the highlights of the academic year. And I wish you a good afternoon and find way, excuse me, a good evening, find ways in which you can adapt and mitigate 
uh, the climate change we go forward, and we look forward to seeing you back at the City of Science in the fall. So thank you very much. Thank you.